Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I had lived a quiet, peaceful life in my little blue cottage on Oak Street for over 10 years. It was a cozy neighborhood filled with kindly retirees and young families just starting out. Giant oak trees lined the streets, providing shade on hot summer days. Kids rode their bikes up and down the sidewalks while neighbors chatted over white picket fences. I had always kept to myself, content with my books, my garden, and the company of my loyal tabby cat, Mittens. That all changed when Karen moved in next door. From the moment her moving van pulled up six months ago, I knew she was trouble. I watched from my front window as she directed the movers with sharp commands, an ever-present scowl on her face. She didn't bother to introduce herself to any of the neighbors that day. That night, I was reading in my study when the doorbell rang unexpectedly. I opened the door to find Karen standing on my porch, hands on her hips. You're my new neighbor? she asked in an imperious tone. Before I could respond, she barged right in, glancing around with a judgmental sneer. I need access to your electricity immediately. My power isn't working and the electric company can't come until next week. I stood in shock at her rude entrance and brazen demand. Excuse me, but you can't just come in and ask to use my utilities. I'm sure if you call the electric company back, they can get the power on sooner. Karen waved her hand dismissively. That's not good enough. Don't be selfish. Your house is on the edge of my property line, so legally I can tap into your supply. I couldn't believe the audacity and strode forward to usher her back out the door. I'm sorry, but that's not how this works. You'll have to make other arrangements. Karen's lips curled in disdain as she turned on her heel and marched out. You'll regret not helping me, she hissed over her shoulder. Over the next few months, Karen became the neighborhood terror. She browbeat the mailman over inadequate service, yelled at landscapers for getting grass clippings on her lawn, and tormented the neighborhood kids for being too loud. I started finding extension cords snaking from my outside outlets over to Karen's house. No matter how many times I unplugged them, they'd be back the next day. One hot July afternoon, the air conditioner sputtered and slowed. I went outside to find thick cords plugged into nearly every free socket. Enough was enough. I gathered them up yet again and stomped over to confront Karen. Her front door was wide open, but the house was silent. Karen! I shouted. You have to stop stealing my electricity! This is your last warning before I call the police! I sensed movement behind me. Karen stood at the bottom of the porch steps, glaring daggers at me with hands clenched into fists. You'll pay for threatening me, she hissed. I always get what I want in the end. A week later, I was stunned to receive legal documents suing me for $50,000 in unpaid utility fees. She claimed I had refused to let her access power she was legally entitled to. I was outraged at the audacity and utter injustice of her claims. Immediately, I called my friend Andrew, who was a lawyer. Don't worry, we've got this. Andrew reassured me after reviewing the suit. I can't believe the nerve of this woman. We'll counter Sue for the electricity she's already stolen from you. The next few weeks were consumed with building an airtight defense against Karen's absurd lawsuit. We compiled evidence including photos of the extension cords, written testimony from other neighbors, and records showing I had never agreed to any utility sharing. The day of the trial arrived. I smoothed my skirt suit with trembling hands, hoping our case was strong enough. Karen strode in wearing a smug expression, obviously convinced of her victory. But her face quickly fell into a scowl when Andrew presented our evidence and moved to dismiss the lawsuit entirely for lack of merit. The judge agreed and Karen's case was tossed out without even going to trial. Not only that, but the judge ordered Karen to pay me the full $50,000 for all the electricity she had illegally siphoned off me. Karen jumped to her feet, face purple with rage, and spat venom at me. You ugly little weasel! You'll regret this! Andrew had to hold me back from lunging at her. Karen stormed off as the bailiff yelled for order in the courtroom. I left the courthouse exhausted but thrilled with the just outcome. The next morning, I was watering my roses when I heard tires screeching around the corner. Karen's big BMW roared down the street, veering across lanes right towards me, I dove behind a tree as the car jolted to a stop just inches from the porch. Karen leapt out, brandishing a pistol aimed right at me. You won this round, but it's not over. I always win in the end, she shrieked. My knees went weak at the sight of the gun leveled at my chest. Suddenly, two police cars whipped around the corner, sirens wailing. Drop your weapon, officers yelled as they surrounded Karen with guns drawn. She screamed in defiance, but finally dropped the pistol and was cuffed. 
I later learned our concerned neighbor Joan had witnessed the incident and immediately called cop. Karen was arrested and charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, and that was the last I saw of her as she was hauled off to jail. In the end, justice prevailed. Karen lost her ridiculous lawsuit, and I even got compensation for the stolen electricity. Her rage at losing drove her to threaten me at gunpoint, but she ended up behind bars where she can't terrorize the neighborhood. I can finally relax again in the peace and quiet of my little cottage, thankful to be rid of the neighbor from hell. My quiet life has returned again, and for that I am truly grateful. The next one is an entitled people story. I was trying to keep things to two posts, but I realized while compiling everything that part two was just too long, so I've divided it into a part three. For those who commented en masse to get cameras, I will when I can afford it. I'm still in financial recovery from buying a house last year. And as far as I know, good cameras need a decent computer to record to, and I don't have anything more than a three-year-old laptop that runs Windows 10. Yes, I am aware of doorbell cams. That will be the first kind I get. For those who kept saying that I should have just gotten my brother and sister-in-law arrested, the only reason I didn't was because they are parents. Their kids need them. And if Dan was arrested, he'd likely lose his job. And without that, his family has no money. And sister-in-law has an only months old baby right now. Neither of them needs to end up in jail. But you don't need jail for revenge. The police can help, yes. But I got payback without filing a police report. Would I be this merciful again? More than likely not, and they know it. I decided to wait on making an account and posting until after the new year, just in case more stuff happened. And it did. As previous readers know, my sister-in-law was making passive-aggressive posts on social media that were obviously directed at me, especially after sister-in-law had her fourth baby in November. She was posting the same repetitive nonsense over and over again. She just found semi-clever ways of rewording it. But she pretty much kept regurgitating that she was tired of living with my parents, that there isn't enough space, she needs her own house, blah blah blah. I know I sound dismissive, but live through what I have with these people, and you'd be ready to sarcastically play tiny violins in front of them too. They're just that bad. And since I waited until January to make an account, more happened just like I thought. I stated before that I'd invited half the family for a Christmas Eve party at my house. And everyone I invited all came, even though it was a fairly long drive of around three to four hours for them. But they wanted to come and show me their support. I was praised by them a lot for how hard I'd worked to get a house on my own, and that they were sorry for everything I'd gone through. I was asked why I didn't just take my camper and drive the three hours back to them, instead of living pretty much homeless for so long and I had to sheepishly admit that I was very attached to living around here, and I had my best employment opportunities in this area. My hometown doesn't have a lot of great job opportunities in my field, if any at all, and I wanted to make my own way as much as I could, an answer they overall accepted. We moved on to having a rather nice party, the best I'd been to in years. Some relatives even brought CDs of great Christmas albums, and I have to say, the one my uncle brought of Ray Charles was my favorite. He sings Christmas songs like no one else I've heard. It was a grand and happy time. I felt like for once I could just forget my past issues and enjoy the moment. But I wouldn't be writing this if it had stayed that way. About two hours into the party, you know who showed up. My parents, brother, and sister-in-law popped in trying to look all smiles. They didn't even knock. Just walked right into my front door like they were meant to be there. I shut off the music and told them to leave immediately. They begged to stay and said they brought gifts. One of my uncles stood up and yelled at them before I got another chance to speak, and he said they don't deserve to be in my home or my life after the crap they tried to pull months earlier. And he was backed up by several other relatives. Mind you, this guy is my mother's brother, and he used to love her to pieces until he found out about the crap that went on between me and my parents. My grandparents, mother's parents, as old as they are, hurriedly got in between us and said to my parents that if they want to make amends with me, it's far too soon and they've never been more disappointed in them than they were this past year. They'd hidden their favoritism for my brother from prying eyes for a long time, but no one was fooled anymore. And they needed to make a serious effort to try and actually treat me like a son if they ever wanted to be in my life again. Then they turned to Dan and sister-in-law and said they've seen the repetitive nonsense sister-in-law keeps posting about. They're tired of it, and to just let it go already, my house will not become their new home. Sister-in-law went back to her old standard of crying and had a pity party about how she should be the one living here and not me. She plopped down in a chair to have a tantrum and say it wasn't fair I got this house to myself when I have no family of my own, 
and she has four kids that need more space, and she just wanted a better place to live in and feel like a real mom. It was petty of me, but I loudly pointed out that she sucks as a mother because she lets my mother do most of the parenting, while she sits on her butt all day drinking, playing on her phone, or going out and spending all of Dan's money, and she has the nerve to complain about it. I even joked that I'm surprised her baby doesn't get drunk from her breast milk since she drinks so much booze, which I admit went a bit too far as I got some stares, and sister-in-law demanded to know if I was calling her a bad mom. I said the evidence speaks for itself, and if she wanted to be able to afford to move out of my parents' house someday, then she needs to put her college degree to some use, get a job, and learn to save money. My mother already does most of the childcare for my brother's kids anyway so she'd have plenty of time after her baby gets a little older. My brother's eldest kid, who's seven years old, ran up to start kicking and screaming at me for yelling at his mom, and he kept at me about how his mom said that I was the bad guy who made her cry and didn't let them live here. That's when my brother grabbed his son to pull him away, but all the other relatives jumped back in, and this sort of turned into a family intervention against my sister-in-law and brother. She was crying, her new baby was crying, her kids were crying. Hell, even Dan was very nearly in tears from the verbal lashing he was being assaulted with. He ended up just sitting on the ottoman, I keep shoes in by the front door and looking like a complete wreck. He couldn't look anyone in the eye, he couldn't even say two words to me, not with a whole house filled with angry people ready to judge him if he tried to let out his inner golden child again. If they weren't there to get in his way, I'd bet this would have ended up a repeat of when he tried to order me around to try and take my house months earlier. By this point, though, he'd been so thoroughly humiliated that his and my parents' reputation in the family was completely destroyed because the masks were all now off. Soon after, my parents, brother, and sister-in-law all left in defeat. The party resumed, and we all avoided speaking of what just happened for the rest of the evening. Since most of the adults had been drinking, everyone stayed the night in my house. I even let some of them sleep in the camper so there'd be enough space. I admit it also makes a good guest house. My relatives all wanted a tour of it earlier as well, and they said they couldn't believe I'd been living in it for around two years. I got a lot of questions about it, like what summer and winter were like, and so on. I was up earlier than everyone else on Christmas morning and had a fresh pot of coffee and some ibuprofen for those spiked eggnog hangovers a few of them had. I was complimented on being a way nicer host than my parents ever were, and we all agreed to do this again next Christmas. After Christmas, sister-in-law did finally stop making posts that were obvious digs at me and deleted all of the old ones as well. But shortly after the new year, she more recently made a new post complaining about how she'd tried to convince my parents to get a camper like I did, so it could be set up in the backyard, and Dan and his family could use the whole house as their family home. Well, a taste of one's own medicine is never fun because my parents turned that idea down, vehemently I hear. No one is going to push them out of their own home, let alone their master bedroom. The post was only up for a couple of days before sister-in-law removed it and she has hardly posted anything since then. She loves to complain, but if a tree falls and no one is around to hear it, can it still complain? Sister-in-law, I guess, has realized there's no point in doing it when no one hears her anymore, and Dan can't afford to move his family out on his salary alone anytime soon. If they end up expecting another child in the next few years, I won't be surprised. Things mellowed down for me since then and I've even invited friends over for a poker night. I suck at poker because I can never remember a damn thing about it, but so what? We get to drink beer and eat junk food while being merry idiots. We all loaded up on Whoppers from Burger King and just had at it the best way four grown men can when they just want to have a good unadulterated time and get pissed drunk. I think maybe around summer I'll look into possibly dating someone. I'm not exactly getting younger here. Fingers crossed that goes well. My camper just sits idle in my yard now, and I admit, there were some days I went out there just to spend time in it. I did live in it for two years. It's like my second home. And maybe one day I'll actually get to use it for camping like it was meant to be. I've never been camping. My parents considered it a waste of time, so it'd be a completely new experience for me. This pretty much marks the end of what happened. My parents, brother, and sister-in-law have all been staying very clear of me. In fact, they seem to have gone back to acting like I don't exist like they did before I bought a house. Not like that bothers me at all. 
it's better that way. But they'll inevitably come back in some way. I know they will. I just wonder what kind of stupid thing they'll do next. If anything notable like all this ever happens again, I'll make another post if this account is still active. The next one is an entitled parent story. So this just happened last night, and I still can't believe someone would do this. I'm a 30M and a paramedic. I've been in EMS for the past eight years, and I absolutely love my job. Last night, we were dispatched to a 75-year-old female who fell at home. The patient stated that she tripped over her carpet and hit her head when she fell. We arrived at the scene and noticed that the home was a duplex, with our patient's door on the right and her neighbor's door on the left. We made our way into the home and found her lying on the floor. The woman was awake and breathing. We started asking her the standard questions. Are you okay? Does anything hurt? Do you remember the fall? Etc. She stated that she has a pounding headache and that she remembers walking to bed and then waking up on the floor. In my field, that's a pretty big red flag. We noticed that she's got a pretty good lump on the side of her head and a big bruise starting to form already. Noticing the bruise, I asked her if she was on any blood thinners. She said that she was on blood thinners for a previous stroke she had a few years ago. We urged her to let us take her to the hospital because there was a possibility that the fall could have caused a bleed in her brain and she should go to the hospital to get some scans done. She agrees, and we begin to package her up. We applied a C-collar around her neck in case of any C-spine neck injuries. She denied any neck or back pain, so we lifted her up and placed her on our stair chair. A stair chair is exactly what it sounds like. It's a chair with tracks that we use to carry patients up and down stairs. As we were getting her out of the house, her neighbor whipped the door open and started yelling about how she couldn't sleep with all the lights and noises outside. The sound of the stair chair apparently woke her up and she was not happy about that. My lieutenant walked over to her and apologized and said that we were dealing with a medical emergency and that we would be leaving soon enough. The neighbor then noticed that our patient was her neighbor, and that's when she started yelling about something totally different. The entitled neighbor started yelling, You can't take her to the hospital! I have errands to run tomorrow and she needs to watch my kids! My lieutenant again reiterated that we were here for a medical emergency and that her health is more important than her errands. The entitled neighbor let out a loud huff and then slammed the door in his face. We thought that was the end of it. We were wrong. After a few minutes in the back of the ambulance, we told our lieutenant that he could take the engine crew back to the station and that we were going to be heading out in a few minutes. After we checked her vitals, got an IV going, and started giving her IV fluids, my partner got out of the back and went up to the driver's seat. About five seconds later, the back doors of my ambulance fly open, and who do I see? The entitled neighbor, of course. Apparently, she needed a few minutes to get dressed before coming outside. I yell at her, What the hell do you think you're doing? She yells back, I told you that she can't go to the hospital because she has to watch my kids tomorrow. She then starts trying to pull the cot out of the ambulance with our patient on it. Luckily, she didn't know how to unlatch the cot and couldn't get her out. Our patient says, I can't watch your kids tomorrow because I fell and I might be having a stroke. The entitled neighbor yells back at her and says, You're fine. You don't need to go to the hospital because you're not having a stroke. My partner then hears the commotion and goes to the back of the ambulance. He pulls her off the cot and I slam and lock the doors. You could tell that the entitled neighbor was about to become combative. It's important to know that either the police department or the sheriff's department responds to our calls too when it's at night. Because of where we were, it took a few minutes for the sheriff's department to show up on the scene, but he got there just in time. I couldn't hear much through the door, but I saw the officer get out of his cruiser with his taser drawn. My partner runs back up to the driver's seat and starts heading to the hospital. The last thing I saw through the back windows was the entitled neighbor stomping towards the officer and then her hitting the ground after being tased. Super satisfying to watch. I was talking with my patient and asked what that was all about and she said that the entitled neighbor will just drop her three young kids off at her house and leave for several hours at a time with no notice. My patient had no idea that she was supposed to watch the kids at all because, again, the entitled neighbor never even gives her a heads up about these things. Like I said in the beginning, this happened last night, so I don't have any updates, but I'll post an update when I learn more. Small update. My contact at the hospital said that the patient does not have a bleed. She does, however, have a really nasty-looking bruise on her face from the blood thinners. It's incredibly common. 
She will most likely be going home soon. There is no update on the neighbor. I probably will not hear anything back until my next shift day. Update. Hey everyone, sorry for the late update. Unfortunately, it's not as exciting as some of you would hope for. So I got in touch with the officer on that call, and he said that the woman was not formally charged with anything. The patient is back home now and resting comfortably. Like I said before, the hospital found no signs of a bleed, and she was discharged the next day. She was advised to file for an order of protection from the neighbor, but I don't believe I will ever be privy to that information unless something happens again. I read a majority of the comments, and most people are saying to contact elder abuse and DCFS. The only problem with filing those reports is having concrete proof. We never actually saw any children, so we can't really say that they are abused or neglected at all. We can say that we have a suspicion, but for all we know they could be living their best lives at home with the entitled parent. If the entitled parent had left and abandoned her kids, then that's another story. Calling DCFS without any signs of child abuse and just working off hearsay can just cause more problems if the accusations are unfounded. The same can pretty much be applied to the elder abuse. We have no actual proof of elder abuse occurring. The entitled neighbor was not involved in the actual fall, and there was no suspicion of any kind of financial, physical, emotional, or social abuse. The way our patient talked about the kids getting dumped on her was in more of an inconsiderate way, and not in an abusive way. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.